Hi, this is Dr. Scott Young, and today we're going to get into a Nasara topic. This one is going to be about a new discussion on debt. Coming right up. Okay, so let's bring this up here and we'll show you more about it. But this actually has come about um, from several conversations I've had with people. And um, while I'm not a lawyer, don't play one on TV, I want to give you some background of where I think we're going and um, really just a, a conversation about how this actually works, okay? So as we talk about debt, one thing I do wanna say is this is my website here. You can see it always on the bottom here. Um, I don't sell crypto. I've never sold crypto. I never recommend crypto. You cannot get the QFS by buying into it. It's already set up for you. If you see any social media site that is other than the ones that are on drscottyoung.com, report and delete. Simple as that. I have no control over these idiots and they're doing it to so many people. Don't buy anything from someone you don't have a clue who you're talking to, okay? Um, you can hear my voice. Some of these people are, are like Indian voices and I'm going, that ain't me, bud. So, you know, deal with that, okay? But we all make we all make choices in that one and you got to understand what, what happened there, okay? All right. So let's get over into this. I want to show you the interview, but before I do this little interview, um, turn up your volume. Turn up your volume, okay? Mine's as loud as I can make this, okay? Um, and so just please make sure you turn your volume as loud as you can go because I can't make it any louder if you're having troubles. If you look back through And there's a number of people that, that have been starting to, uh, Ray Dalio is kind of hinting at this, but you're, you're right. Um, you've got this, the left is rising and the right is rising. And, and the left especially is very anti-predator. So if you're in the left wing in Europe and you're a millennial, you see the uh, baby boomers of, of Europe have saddled these countries with debt. And these young people are looking at these debt loans and saying, over time, each year that goes by, you know, I don't, I don't, at some point, there's going to be a movement strong enough to walk away from that debt. And that's, if you look back to the history of capital, then maybe you can explain a little bit too, but um, through, through the last, going back, it's in the Bible, these references to debt jubilees. It's a debt reset. And I think that that's what we're heading to in the next, I think anywhere between two to five years, be some type of debt jubilee or debt, debt reset. I, I, you know, I actually agree with that too. I think, uh, David Zerbos has been talking about this as well. I think Japan's probably the first place to look at it because they're more advanced with this whole debt cycle. And the point being is the central bank already owns 60 odd percent of the debt. Yes, yes. And so at what, at what point is the central bank in the next recession just end up owning all of the debt and then say, what debt? It's gone, right? Yeah, that accounting trick. Yeah. What do they call it? A coin? You create a coin? And you're... Yeah, <laughs> whichever way it's done. Yeah. That accounting trick is a debt jubilee, essentially. Yeah. Because um, you say to the government, okay, that debt's written off now, the central bank own it, we'll call it, we'll call it quits. There will be, obviously, some repercussions. What that is, it's probably the currency collapses. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of people, when they hear this, um, when economists hear that conversation about a debt jubilee, they see it as a good thing for the banks. And the answer is, and then they, then they go, well, then the currency will collapse. By the way, anyone who says that is thinking from, an, uh, from a world, real world economic statement, okay? Or a fiat type of statement. The reality is that when we look at the debts, the debts have to wipe away and i'm going to show you more about that and it is not going to hurt you with that but let me kind of do a couple little points in here on personal debt 
personal debt, well, <clears throat> really talking about mortgage, student loans, car, credit cards, cars, you know, kinds of things like that. Compound interest is so much worse than we realize. Um, in the past, <clears throat> that you might look at, at some of the compound interest, and I'll show you some calculators a little bit more, <clears throat> but we have, when we, we talk about some of the interest rates for a home loan, for instance, at 7%, you're talking about 58% of that loan is debt, and more specifically interest. So you almost never <coughs> pay these, these puppies off. Sorry, <clears throat> allergies are really bad right now. It's not my cough coming back, it's just allergy issues, okay? So, and, and I'm gonna show you how, how just massive this is a problem going on for people. Um, and I always want, you know, people know some of this, but they don't know all of it. But, you know, back in, I want to say about 2009, um, I had to delete a partner um, out of the company, actually deleted two. Um, but the direct partner that, that had it, he had $70,000 of debt that came off. And I'm going to bring you up this off the screen here for a second. Um, hold on one second. So he had $70,000 of personal debt. And when he did his personal bankruptcy, which did foreclosure and then bankruptcy, I get this little note saying, you got to pay off. I mean, you got to wipe out his debt. And I'm going with what? Now, I sort of had a clue that I had to do this. It was late in 2009 or something like that. <clears throat> but I, I had no understanding of how I did this. And I remember talking to the the state of Oklahoma at the time, I'm like, well, I'm not a bank. Like I don't have like the ability to write that puppy off. And, and she was, you know, if she were looking at me on the phone, you know, she'd be looking at me like, what do you want me to do? Basically, uh, you're screwed in, in essence. Um, you know, we at the time were probably about $530,000, you know, um, uh, gross receipts. When we look at that, we had $435,000 of debt, 90% debt to income ratio. I mean, I, I, when I, my dad actually paid for a bankruptcy attorney to look at my, my books at the time. And the guy instantaneously without even, you know, talking more about it, you got, you got it, you got to declare bankruptcy. And, and God didn't want me to. I, I'm, you might not believe that, but that's absolutely the cat, the case. And I know that, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is that many of you are standing on the edge of bankruptcy, whether you have an attorney on the background or whether you have friends and family, you know, that are telling you, or you're listening to the creditors. This is the noise that we all hear. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you just a quick story, but I remember you know, there were um, a four out of six months in through, from 2010 to 2011 that I just kept saying, well, should I just declare bankruptcy? And, you know, God, God came back to me about on, on that sixth month of, of the four of the six months, but on the sixth month that I was in the middle of this real massive credit crunch. And that credit crunch went on for years with this. And I would pay myself almost nothing I would pay myself just enough to like cover a couple of the bills, but I was paying, pulling money out of my second mortgage to pay my first mortgage. Very dangerous, difficult time frame. Um, and you know, I didn't have a lot of personal debt, but the business debt was so overwhelming. And what business debt happens is that it likes to come over and sit on top of your head. Um, for personal areas. And they were throwing it on my personal credit report, which even made me worse with this too. And this was the sickness of, again, of the system with that. And I remember God saying, you know, shut up, stop talking about bankruptcy. And it took me almost four months of like asking God about this one, researching and asking questions until I realized he didn't say I was going to declare bankruptcy and he didn't say I wasn't going to declare bankruptcy. He just didn't want me to talk about it. 
And that's a very difficult position to be in. And that's exactly how God talks. He doesn't tell you the future of this, which is exactly what we would all want, right? We would want the future and the answers. But um, it was me stop talking about it. And we never did. And it doesn't mean that you don't ride through these, these, these credit journeys with absolute utter sleepless nights. I understand it. I understand it more than most people will understand it. Because if I did business bankruptcy, it would have led to personal bankruptcy and foreclosure. And it, it not only would have wiped out, you know, me and my family, it would have wiped out the employee at the time only had one employee, but I, you know, I actually have had 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 two or so in at that time frame. And so it would have messed with her. It would have messed with um, all the patients that, that have been working with me, which, which have been a bunch of people. Um, and so basically I would have screwed them just as much as anything else um, with this. I mean, there was so much riding on me. And the reality is, you know, I needed to wait for God's, you know, leading and everything. And I know many of you don't feel this way. I mean, you feel this, but you you feel you feel stuck. Okay, and that's why I'm talking about this a little bit more today. So, as we kind of look at that that situation, what we see is mostly there are crushes. These crushes come because we don't have enough information. We don't understand our personal debt. We don't understand the usury of debt that happens by the banks and these lawmakers are the sickest puppies and stupid on top of it. Let me tell you, let me show you one. And when you first hear Elizabeth Warren talk, what you're going to feel like is you will agree with her. This is a smart person. Okay, don't give me, don't miss this point. She's definitely part of the cabal with this, but she's she's intelligent and she gets you sucked in. Now she's probably talking to a book club or whatever the heck it is, but there's probably 30, 40, 80 people there. I don't I don't know the number, but you, you can see it's pictures in the background, so it's it's a limited number of people with this. But again, turn up your volume so you can kind of hear what's said. This is many years ago. My favorite part of looking at this whole, we got this whole uh, uh, $1, billion, uh, $1 trillion on tax cuts for the rich under George Bush. We got into this whole $2 trillion on two wars that we put on a credit card for our children and grandchildren to pay off. And we got into this whole $1 trillion on a Medicare drug program that A, was not paid for, and B, is 40% more expensive than it needs to be because it was a giveaway to the drug companies. So we just have, I mean, that's just $4 trillion right there. So part of the way you fix... Now, by the way, right there, she is throwing government and big tech, big corporations under the bus. Now, she shifts gears. Watch this. This problem is like, don't do those things. <laughs> No, there is nobody in this country who got rich on his own. Nobody. You built a factory out there, good for you. But I want to be clear, you moved your goods to market on the roads the rest of us paid for. You hired workers the rest of us paid to educate. You uh, were safe in your factory because of police forces and fire forces that the rest of us paid for. You didn't have to worry that marauding bands would come and seize everything at your factory and hire someone to protect against this because of the work the rest of us did. Now look, you built a factory and it turned into something terrific or a great idea. God bless. Keep a big hunk of it. But part of the underlying social contract is you take a hunk of that and pay forward for the next kid who comes along. (laughs) 
Okay, so let me let me kind of dive into that that little conversation there. So she puts uh, government George Bush, and then she actually runs Obama under the bus too with his Medicare drug program. I kid you not, it's funnier than spit. So this has got to be 2009, 2010. I don't know the exact date of that one. Okay. She's thinking about running, and, and it might have been, you know, when Obama was running and she was running too. And she's kept, she's run several times in different ways, right, as a senator. Okay, so we, um, and I'm bringing something else onto the screen here in a second as well. I want to show you, and we will uh, bring that up here in a second. But what she, she then does is moves over to fair taxation. And what she's talking about is IRS taxation, okay? Meaning income tax ta taxation. And she's going, you drive on the roads, you have um, police, and you have, you know, all these other, other benefits for a good size company. Keep the profits for the most part, but pay your dues so that the kids can be paid back. And the answer is, that is the utter lie. The IRS never has paid for any of those. Roads are paid by the states through sales tax and excise tax. Police is paid by the state through excise tax and sales tax. What? You've never heard that one, right? The, you know, I mean, none of what she said is even viable because what happens is that you're paying toward, you know, toward that next generation. Well, let's show you how bad they are at this, this process with this. Okay. Now this is a debt clock. We are going to kind of get into this just a little bit. Some of you know that I have, you know, strong feelings necessarily that uh, of the manipulated nature, but I'm going to show you a couple things. Okay. Um, U.S. national debt at the second, $34.6 trillion. Ugly, stupid number, okay? The budget deficit, now this is interesting. Budget is way higher than, their, uh, th than what we have as uh, a yearly amount. So they're running at a one point, basically 1.8 deficit on a yearly basis. Some people will say that we're running, at, I mean, the, the reality is we're probably doubling that debt, the national debt at $1 trillion every 100 days. In essence, that's $4 trillion-ish a year. Not really one. That's why this you can't always take that. And I have to look over this other screen here because it's easier for me to see. Um, $6 trillion $6.5 trillion of U.S. spending. Um, in the past, um, what that number was is 53%. In 80, it was 34%. In 50, or, sorry, in 2000, it was 58%. So it went back up. And now we're at 123%. How long can you last going on that those kinds of numbers? And the answer is not very long. When you look at the U.S. federal tax revenue, this is IRS income tax is four trillion, four point seven trillion dollars, versus the gross national product, which is just the, our domestic product, is twenty seven trillion. Now this isn't available for them, but this is this this ugly number. Now you're saying that fourteen k per citizen is due to do this. That means no one should ever get a tax refund. That's, that's, that's literally saying everyone should be paying at least 14 k <clears throat> Many people aren't. So this is totally off. Excise tax is really only $79, uh, um, 79 billion. Income tax is $2.2 trillion. Payroll tax, $1.5 trillion. Now, excise tax is a small number on a federal level with this too. So we have these other things of corporate tax revenue, 477, this is crazy, <laughs> of 400, let's see here, let me forget this right here, uh, billion or trillion, 477 corporate tax revenue. So there's way more, uh, way more tax revenue 
that's actually out there available to tax. And that's what she's sort of talking about. And again, I'm not going to get too hard on this. We got one on a state debt. Each of the states are about $1.2 uh, trillion in the hole. Uh, it, it's it, it's mind-boggling, okay? Under here, um, the total interest paid is $4.4 trillion on just the debt. Credit card, or total debt of the people. This is not including this number, but we want to say that it is. Some people want to put it at, at this includes that. I don't believe so. Um, because I think it's higher than this number, actually. They're saying $97 trillion. Uh, it's, th th that's a ridiculous number. Total debt interest is $25 trillion. Um, <clears throat> and then here's what happens. The money supply is $412 billion in the hole. If some people are telling you that we're $150, $110 trillion or billion in the hole. We're now maybe higher, way higher than that. And no one will tell us this exact number. I've seen 150 trillion or billion in the hole, but now we're seeing maybe 412 billion in the hole. I don't know the number. What's our dollar worth? Not a blessed thing. And when you look over here at the secret window, you see there's a, some manipulation going on here. Okay. <clears throat> Let me show you a little bit. I have to <clears throat> move into this screen again <clears throat> and bring this puppy up. Sorry, takes a second. So again, I want to show you a little bit about this. So we talked, we showed you that debt clock. Okay, let's talk about some of the, the relative points out there. Um, it, it's relatively accurate. Um, it's, it's not perfect, but we, it's, we don't know so much. The reality, what I've been... Um, testing on the waters is in the last four years and we're in 2024 the last four years we might be at 10 to 13 trillion extra dollars on the debt so i don't know if it's 34 trillion or not again i showed you the domestic product at 27 trillion versus the federal debt at 34 trillion and personal debt at 25 trillion these are these are probably too low especially this one here out of a number now, the concerns that you would have, again, it's manipulated. This whole thing is manipulated. The dollar to gold ratio is set to zero, which when you have that, that has no, that's, that's the manipulation. If economists should look at that and go, that's not true. And the answer is, that's exactly true. Fiat has no relation to a real asset. What we're, we believe the belief out there right now in a lot of the patriot community is that corporate and business or excuse me corporate and personal debt is at maybe 137 trillion 4. trillion dollars 4.4 trillion of interest on debt and 4.7 trillion on tax debt i mean irs can't even pay back the interest i mean i mean other than 3 Three hundred billion dollars, they can pay the interest. You see, we are so far behind the eight ball. It's not funny. You guys think that we are. You know, people talk about a recession, um, or you know, the Great Recession in two thousand eight, two thousand ten area time frame. Uh uh, we are thirty times worse than the Great Depression. All the numbers stipulated. We're talking about price. We're talking about inflation issues. We're talking about debt issues are so crushing. And to buy a house or to buy a car is so difficult that most people just go, I can't do it. And if they do, they get themselves so deep into the levels of debt. It, it, it's very difficult for people. Okay. There's a conversation called bank derivatives that I want to show you that is actually a deeper problem. This was an issue in 2008, 2009. So basically the definition, and it's a little hard, so just stick with me for a minute. Basically, these are financial contracts from bank to bank or bank to corporation. So what they do is they take cr the credit of something, right? And they, they set it up for a contract. 
So by the way, when you have a contract, what you're doing is I'm going to make a row, I mean, a, a driveway for you, and I stipulate that it's gonna cost $7,000 to pour a driveway, whatever, right? Now I'm looking at my cost of goods and my employee rate and how long it takes to do that, blah, 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 right? Some, some, some of those things. And I've got to look at all of that. It's not just the hourly rate of 72 bucks an hour, 82 bucks an hour, whatever the number you're, 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 you're trying to cover for all the employee work, whatever that might be. Um, but I, I come up with a basic calculator um, amount, right? So let's just say I said 7,000. You, as the homeowner, might say, great, I'll do it, okay? So now we have a, an internal value that both sides have agreed upon. Now, when banks do this, they're doing it off of, uh, off of a fictitious thing. These derivatives have literally no meaning. The derivatives can be traded and they, it creates a higher value for a fake asset. What does the bank bring as an asset? Do they bring a service? Do they bring a, a product you know, to market? And here's the funnier thing. The rules are, that are created are created by bank supervisors. And it only benefits them because why would they benefit anyone else? And so the corporations go trade on. If we're talking about the massive corporations. And then we have the worst type of derivative, which is a credit derivative, derivative, which most of the derivatives are really frankly based upon. They don't tell you this, but this is truly the case. They're trading contracts of the debts. They package up debts and then trade them to one another. Not only we're talking about bad debts, but good debts, meaning debts that are paying on time. So good credit, and we'll show you some of the good credit. Let me show you something super fascinating. And I just looked at this in 2023, uh, uh, we had um, $171 trillion in debts. And let me just show you. So Goldman Sachs, highest one out there, right? Chase, $50 trillion. Citibank, 46, BOA, 18, Wells, 13. I mean, these are huge numbers that, they're, that they have out there as potential. They call them tradable assets. And I say that is bogus because in, as they're so in, unstable. You see, if most people were able to pay the debts that were out there, then you'd say, well, maybe that is a, that is a profit that someone can create. Cool. But as everyone strips away and more and more people strip away from their ability to pay for things, these debt, these debt points, and they're a balance sheet point, these debt things are actually sidling these banks and killing them. PNC over here only has $677 uh, billion, and they're almost done as a, as, a, as a corporation. In 2020, they were higher. $50 trillion for Chase, forty-eight for Goldman Sachs. See, Goldman Sachs has gone up in that number. Uh, Chase stayed about the same for the most part. But Citibank went from... Uh, went had 42 and then added more to 46. BOA, 18, 18. Okay, so they stayed about the same. Wells went from nine to 13. So they're going up. I mean, the higher you go up, it isn't a better thing for you. This is why the stock market makes no sense because this is created on the stock markets. These are, these are, these are really what's traded. Uh, State Street, uh, two and two, basically. Um, PNC goes from 522 to 677. So they've jumped up with this thing too. Let's go backward in time. 2007 at 164 trillion. Now, I want you to see this in a second, and then I'm going to compare those two puppies for a second, okay? Chase, 84 trillion. They were the worst of the worst in this one versus where they are at 50 right now. 
BOA, 33, verses 18 in the past. Awakovia, basically not on the list here, but they were at four. Wells at one, now Wells is sitting at 13. They're, they're toppling, right? PNC 286 versus PNC 677. Now you know why PNC has their problems. And what derivatives are, it's like I'm treading on water. We're talking about living on people's debts in essence, okay? And they're trading upon this, this, the nature of this. They are so top heavy in their debts. Now, if in 2007, it was, it was a $164 trillion number. And if you know anything about where we are today, remember I've told you about, let me pull this off the screen. So I just want you to hear me for a second. Sorry, it takes me a second to find my little mouse. It moves. Okay. So I went, debt cycles happen from 1913 to 1933 when, or 1929 to 33. That was when they had a debt flushing cycle. No one actually knows exactly what they did. 1933 ish to 1971 to 74, another debt cycle where they had to flush down the toilet. And what happened is we had a gas crunch there. The other one was the great depression. 1999 to 2001 is another cycle point. And right then we had the false flag of 9-11 so that they could crunch the economy and steal out $3 trillion just for their own pockets. 2020 was supposed to be the bankruptcy phase that they would move into the Great Recession. Or excuse me, the Great Reset, sorry. Okay, so if the Great Recession occurred with 60, 164 trillion. You see the problem at 2020. They were way over leveraged and all of them were over leveraged. Now Chase is in a slightly better position, but they weren't in a great position. They're still in the top, you know, they're always top two, no matter what happens, right? Now you think, well, they've, they've reduced it a little bit. Yeah, because they're not borrowing. They're not borrowing to people. When you look at the borrow rate here versus here, you got $4 trillion more borrowing that happens and it sunk people. So people are coming in at this point and, and the credit derivative is worse than here, even though the number is lower. It's because there's less and less people who are actually able to pay for those debts. So credit derivatives are really I mean, these credit derivatives, the bank derivatives of all different, and they all have different types, okay? They package them different ways to make them look prettier. But a box of poo ain't, ain't worth anything. It doesn't matter if you put a gold, you know, bow around the end of it, right? Okay. Come on. How credit scores work? Because a lot of people don't understand this. And I have had conversations with people. Now, as an audiologist and as a person who has actually seen to people's debt because they will have to talk about they want to get into uh, a financing. Okay, we utilize these companies. One of them is Wells Fargo to utilize for uh, financing rates. Okay, so scores. It's it, what the scores are is a biggest the massive combination. It's around mm, sixty to seventies or sixty five percent of everything comes from your payment history and your current debt ratio, meaning your debt to income. So if whatever you're, if you have, you know, a, a, a $50,000 or make it easier for, for Scott. Okay. Uh, you know, 50, well, let's just say $50,000. Okay. So $50,000, $15,000 of debt is 30% debt to income. So if you have $15,000 of debt, that's pretty heavy for the number. Okay that actually will mess with your your debt. And that's talking about per year when we look at that. We're not talking about the overall total number, okay? When you go and look at your credit report, you'll see hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, right? But we're talking about what the debt load is for that year. So that's a ratio that happens based upon your income. Now, if your what payment history means is how well are you paying your debts? Okay, so if you are late and late 
and late again and late again, and then they have to punt it, kind of push, punt it over to cr- collection agencies, that becomes a messed up to your credit score. Again, if you're 30 to um, 30% debt to income, it qualifies for bankruptcy. And when I was at 90, of course I qualified for bankruptcy. I didn't know that, but that's exactly where I was. Here's the thing. Most people don't understand this either. As unsecured loans are kind of quick credit scores. They look at your credit scores and they either approve you or not. And I'll show you more about that in a second. Those are credit card, medical debt. Um, th- there's other kinds of debts, smaller amounts that are not really collectible. You can't like run over and let's say someone had a medical debt like a teeth, right? And so they get what's called care credit for dental work, okay? And for that dental work, can the uh, care credit company, which is GE credit, by the way, and GE, could they go and take your your teeth out? Well, hopefully they don't, but you might want them to do that compared to what they they mess with you in other ways, right? So those are unsecured loans, so they, they can't really get it back, which allows them to add more interest than normal, okay? These are not like the same interest levels. Rate today, most of those are 12 to 16% interest. And some of them, if you have bad credit, they can go way above 20 and they're 24% crazy numbers, okay? Whereas a secured loan is a house or a car, for instance, okay? There are a couple other secured loans, but those are basically the secured loans that we want to talk about. Secured loans are things that they can repossess from you. Because they can repossess your house, and we'll show you some numbers here in a second, they get to take the whole thing as a profit point later on, even if they show it as a loss, which means they can turn it and sell it and and make money off of it, like a car or a house, okay? So that's why you get lower um, interest rates and, you know, more favorable, you know, uh, processes for secured loans, right? but they're just as dangerous as the credit card kind of stuff. So again, I want you to think about this. Now, some of you don't know your credit report. You can easily do this like on Experian credit report, you know, kind of thing, Experian.com, sign in. It's a free thing. You can watch which credit is, okay? Now, I'm not trying to ask you to do it. I'm just saying if you want to know what the heck your number is, this is the way to know it. If your score is less than 630, you are not probably going to get loans. They will tell you oppositely, but I'm telling you right now, you're not going to get an unsecured loan. The only way you might get a secured loan is to have a lot higher rate and um, a lot of sidling to mess with you. It better be a secured loan, meaning a car or house, but it's not going to be very favorable and some banks won't even do it. And as we've gotten closer to the debt ratio, so let me go backward in time. Okay. I want you to see this. Oops, sorry. I want you to see this when we go back to this thing, when we have um, 630 credit and we have people in this time frame, they weren't giving out loans very well. They were supposed to. The federal government, by the way, in 2009, told them they had to give up money and they weren't doing it. Now, in 2020, they were giving out loans like candy. They were giving out secured loans in the craziest situations, just like they were doing in 2007 before. More specifically, they had done it from 2001 to 2007. This is, or 2009, let's just say one to 2009. That takes Bush and Obama in both of those things. They're peas in a pod. There's no difference between these two idiots, okay? And so what happens is that they were giving out, I mean, they were in charge of this and they were happy with this. So, and because they were making billions of dollars off of these things because they were part of the trade. So what happens is that they should have been more cautious, but they were supposed to give some loans away because the federal government was backing them. Here, we should have been very cautious with a slowdown that was happening due to COVID issues. 
and yet they gave away more loans than they could possibly imagine. Which leads us to a time frame, and you go, well, they have it. It's a little bit less. But now these, these, these things are way less secure. Okay? Let's go forward here again. So now these loans are worse. And, and you have less people that really can qualify. And then they get more sticky and stingy on that, even if you're 630 and above. So what happens here is that 250 to 4, 570 is basically a poor credit rating. And by the way, if you have, um, if you're six months behind on something, you are literally at 530 right then. Um, fair credit rating, you see up to 669, that's, that's actually generous of the number from what I see. Good 670 to 730. When you get over 740, that's when you start to get into better rates that you can get and the best ones. Now see, when they tell you on the, on the TV screen, when you see Dodge or pick the car company and they go for well-qualified buyers, this 2.5% for 48 months. And you're going, so the credit industry isn't, isn't doing as bad. I'm mean, going, do you know how you have, what you have to be? You have to be over 800 to get that rate. Sorry, idiot system of my Acrobat reader wants to get in here. Okay. So they have to, you have to be way over 800 to get those, okay? Um, but you also got to make sure that your debt to income is be way better than 30%. So it's not just this number, but they're going to look at, especially when they do secured loans, they're going to look more at your debt to income ratio. Okay. Now, my question is, if you're at, make up a number, you're 550. And you're trying to get away from, let me, let me pull this off the screen for a second. If you're at 550, what, what kind of loan can you get? I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to get much, if anything. And we run around in fear. We have bankruptcy attorneys and everyone else, and they're, are you, they're going to get you, and they're, they're going to make you worse. And I'm going, what's the difference between 550 and 450 credit? Nothing. What's the difference between 450 and 279 like that? Nothing. Now, there are people who have zero credit ratings, and they actually have good, good ability to pay for it. But because they don't use any debt load, they got a zero credit rating. I, I've met plenty of these people. Most of them are older, and they've never trusted the debt system. They've lived on a pure cash basis in essence, okay? They might have a credit card, but they just, they pay it off at the end of the month and then that's it. I mean, they don't have any other debt points, right? So these are, that, that's some of the things. And then those people can't get loans either. And when you should want to give loans to this, that's the fraudulence of this system with this. But I ask you this question, what are you trying to get away from if you're 550? I, I don't, hey man, do whatever you, you think you should do and really pray about this. What's God telling you to do? Now, my credit when I was 90% debt to income ratio, I was think was like, it was going down to like the 650s or so. Um, I And frankly, um, it didn't, well, I think it was a little higher than that, maybe 670s or something like that. And yet, if I tried to get a business loan to refinance a lot of this stuff, I, no one gave me a dime. Not one single bank. Not the Small Business Association, which is SBA, that, that are, are helpful for you as a business person. Nothing. I didn't even try for years to buy anything because I, I was so sidled with, with, with debt issues and not paying myself enough so I didn't even try to do anything. If I had, I have no idea. But I de definitely tried to get loans for the business. And because I had all kinds of other um, debt to income ratios that were loading on my personal credit, it doesn't just, isn't just the, the credit score. It was 
the, the debt to income. So I could get credit cards, but I couldn't get anything more than that. And again, the credit cards at the time, and even today, 18, 20% kind of things, okay? And so we're talking about 30 times worse than any other time frame since the Great Depression, and possibly worse than that. So when we look at this, let me pull this up. When we move to from a fiat to Nasara, and we're, we're talking about relating to debt, okay, you cannot follow the old system of debt to rise out of it. I mean, you, the, the, first off, the debts wipe, okay? They, they wipe because you have to wipe the system. You heard the first video. You have to wipe the system. Whether you were in the Great Reset or you're in the sorry, they have to wipe those things, okay? The, the scary part is if you're in the Great Reset, if they wipe the debts, you will be saddled with something worse. It will be worse for you, okay? Um, there will be a new type of debt prison you just don't know about right that, at the time that you're first speaking, okay? Um, but you, number one, need to have education and a release because this is going to release. It's really cool, okay? They cannot bring those debts over. There's a new principle at work. When you go from fiat to gold standard, the valuing of money and work for it, it totally changes because what will happen is that we have to turn off the income tax stuff. The income tax never pays for roads. It never pays for schools. It never pays for any of that stuff. Don't believe it. And Elizabeth Warren knows better. Most of them know better, and some of them don't, maybe. I pick someone who doesn't. But they're believing the lie or they're lying. Either way, it doesn't really matter. What happens is we move into a sales taxation, which is a fair type of taxation. Now, again, I'm not going to get into this because I get into this with other ones. Okay. Basically, when you move into a fiat to a gold system and we delete the debt, scores will not have a meaning. I don't care if you worked your butt off to get 805 credit rating. It won't have a meaning because you still have some debt to income, right? You, you have a 5% debt to income and you paid all your bills and let's say you're eight, eight, you know, 805 credit. Once you have zero credit, I mean, zero debt to income, how do they calculate that? Here's the other, on the other side of this fence. What if you have 550 credit? And, and then suddenly because of the debt wipeout that Nasara is gonna bring, and just Sara too, just Sara, just for each of the nations, don't ask me that same question, happens for each of the nations too. Once you have no debt to income, there is no way to calculate credit scores because I told you the two biggest credit score points were number one, I'm not flipping you off here, I'm doing the, the, the ring finger. Number one is, the, is your, um, your debt to income and number two is payment history. Well, you won't have any more payment history. Do you see what I'm saying? What will banks do? Now, banks will still be loaning people. Don't think you're going to have millions of dollars and everyone has no, everyone has a ton of money. And then if everyone has a ton of money, um, there, uh, there's a, move, a Disney movie with a, a robot thing and he walks around the planet. I don't know what it is. It doesn't really matter. You, you, will, you guys will tell me what it is. But the point is, um, is that in that movie, it was p powerful because... All the people were up on a, a space station. Again, it's a, a, a again, it's a uh, animation. Um, and in there, everyone's people's on the space station. No one worked. No one did anything. They were fat. You know, that's what would happen if someone else is doing all of the works because everyone had the money. It, it just don't believe the fantasy. Okay, what banks would have to do is start looking at your budget. They're going to reset things from budget person to person. You're going to, they're going to look at what you can afford with your budget. And some of you are not going to like some of that conversation. 
Um, Mark Z and I and several other people have talked about this. There is a, something called the rule of 78. There's actually the rule of 72 as well that comes out as well. What they do is they front load the interest. And then after the interest is paid off under simple interest, a very small, simple interest, they front load the interest so that the bank gets paid first. And then after that, Every day after that point, you're paying back on um, your principal every single payment, maybe six months to a year, uh, depends on the loan type, whatever, okay? That's one type of thing. Now, if you read on Google and they'll tell you simple, I mean, the rule of 78, they will say, oh, it's the worst thing from since sliced bread. Sounds like the best thing, but you get my point. Um, what what they're trying to tell you is that it was it was predatory lending. No, it wasn't. It was a good thing. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have three hundred thousand dollar house, okay, on simple interest, a thirty year fixed loan, two percent of simple interest, okay. Off of that three hundred thousand, you'd have one hundred eighty thousand dollars of of interest. Now. It actually might be better than that on the rule of 78. So don't get too locked up because, I mean, it's hard to like do a calculator of rule of 78 because most of them put the interest all the way through the time frame. It more likely would be very significantly less than that. I just don't have uh, a, a rule of 78 simple interest calculator front loading the, the interest. I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you that number. I would say it's probably less than that. Maybe it's seventy to one hundred thousand dollars of interest. But just think about this for a second. Just think if the interest was going all the way through. It'd be thirteen thirty three a month on that on that place, right? On a three hundred thousand dollar house, compound interest thirty years seven percent. Very common number now. You'd have to pay four hundred and eighteen thousand dollars, which makes it almost two thousand bucks. Like that's a six hundred and sixty dollar extra of payments on the same thing. Six hundred and sixty bucks. Like, do you, now you wonder why people just not buying anything? And the more that they don't buy anything, the less that anyone can do anything about it. So let me pull it off the screen here. When you can't buy anything, nothing happens. So the credit things. And the banking systems come to a an halt. And when they come to a halt, nothing is occurring. And that's where I couldn't have believed it. I would not have asked for Nasara to do this thing and, and, and the White Hats to do the thing. But you know what? This is where we are. I know you're all frustrated. I know many of you have creditors screaming at you. I have, um, I have these these QFS crypto idiots um, out there, totally messing with my life, right? You know, and and then people come into me desperate. How do I get my money back? I didn't take it from you, right? They're just as scammy as the creditors. And then we all all of us have the GOP or the Democratic Party or whatever, trying to get you to buy something, spend some, some money, buy text messages, and they will not stop. You get spam calls, you get spam emails. By the way, what do you do with spam emails and all that stuff? I, you ignore them, right? You swipe, delete, you know, put them in junk. What should we do with a lot of the creditors? I mean, if you're already underneath, and I understand that, and you're waiting for Nasara, I get it. I understand. I feel your pain. I really do. There is no one who isn't where you are. And if they're, they aren't, it's because they're not in debt. But guess what? They're also looking around and terrified if they don't know anything about Nasara. They're terrified because they're not spending any money because they don't know what's going to happen to their money. They are terrified. There's no one who's not terrified. This is why the 
the cabal is so losing everything. This, this whole system of theirs is completely stupid. And every stupid thing that they do, like the squatter rights and all the, the ridiculous idiot points that they do, just pisses people off more and leans them way away from either party. Either party. Well, I'm, not, I'm not being left or right here. Uh, either party. They're just the two sides of the same coin. It's... I mean, it's both sides. It doesn't matter. I'm telling you, throw away the coin, in essence, okay? And, and Nasara does that. But you need to start mentally preparing to do that. When I was in that much debt, I had no choices. And then when God said, don't do bankruptcy, or don't talk to me about bankruptcy, and I realized what he said was, he didn't tell me I was going to have bankruptcy. He didn't tell me I was going to have bankruptcy. He just said... Don't talk to me about this anymore. I'm not saying God's going to say that to you. Maybe you do need to. Maybe you don't. I don't know. But you need to hear from God. And you need to get it in a quiet place where you don't hear the noise and say, what do I need to do? Because even the moment that we have the flip into Nasara points, you will also need to do that too. Even though you're released from the debt loads, you will need to get in front of God and go, okay, now what? I can't live like I was doing it in the past. Just because you're out of the debt point doesn't mean you should go out and start spending. I've never told anyone to spend anything because of Nasara. Debt loads. No. Stupid. That is the dumbest thing in the world. What you need to consider is what do you need to do to move in to a gold-backed currency, which means start to budget. Delay gratification, okay? It's why we were in, in the situation we were in the past for the most part. Not everyone, because some people then had a, a husband who died, a wife who, who left you and left you with all the debts happens. And then you are in a credit crunch. But it was because you made these purchases you really couldn't afford anyway. And, and, and you have to take the responsibility on that on you too. Even though you're, you, you had ugly things happen to you, we all need to take that responsibility. And you're talking to a person who lived through it. And I paid those debts off. And it was so crazy to pay those debts off. But it, it taught me, don't get into debt again. Do not do it again. And so I haven't from a business standpoint. I, I don't even, do, I mean, I have a little tiny debt uh, with the house, but I, I don't do it because I, I, and it means I don't go out and eat and I don't go out and do all the same things that a lot of people do. It's because I'm learning a new process a new way of living with that too. But it does mean that I, I mean, I have less and less money coming in because the economy is slowing. And so it's so much more difficult. I, I get it. I get it. Guys, I'm praying for you right now. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit is the comforter. Be calm. I promise you the systems of the world is dying. There is an end to this. It will stop. You just have to be calm. There's a, 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 there is a sign. You cross your hands and cross over down below you, okay, like this, okay? It's called peace. And I just pray peace over you right now. In Jesus' name I pray.